We're now going to be moving into the Renaissance period and we're going to be reading the play Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. Before we do that, I want to give you a bit of background information on not only the Faust legend, but also a brief synopsis of the play as well as some themes that are present. Now, the early modern period in Germany is from 1350 to 1600, and that, gave, that time period gave rise to legends. Early modern legends are folk heroes, and they're not warriors or chieftains. And like earlier legends, folk heroes also exist on the margins of recorded history. Now, the historical Faust is probably a kind of a shadowy character, and he probably lived from about 1480 to 1538. He seems to have been an astrologer and an alchemist of ill repute, which was not uncommon in those times. Faust was indeed a Renaissance man, and he was active in all branches of arts and sciences. And a lot of similar characters from that time period are Periclesis, Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, Copernicus. But unlike these characters, Faust seems to be more of a, a swindler than an actual real scientist. So the legend of Faust. The Faust legend is a conglomeration of these characters and then earlier medieval accounts of wizards and sorcerers such as Merlin the Magician. The Faust legend arose about 70 years later as a loose collection of stories that were associated with Faust and they came to be out of oral transmission. The one defining element of all versions of the legend is the pact with the devil. And that's an ancient idea and that's found in a number of classical and medieval works. Faust was fascinated or Faust fascinated Renaissance audiences because his pact called into question the great advantages of the age, which was humanism, science, art, and philosophy. So Marlowe's drama can't be exactly dated. He may have used the German version or only the English or some combination of the tragical history of the life and death of Dr. Faustus. He died in 1593, but the first printing of Dr. Faustus was in 1604, and then a later printing came in 1616 that contained a number of differences. Now, the later versions of Faust legend appeared to have appeared through Europe and America, and every generation presents its own version of the Faust legends based on their own aspirations, desires, and fears. Modern versions of Faust don't usually punish Faust for seeking forbidden knowledge and experience. So maybe think about what would a contemporary American version look like this? We still see examples in modern film and modern literature here in America today. So here's a quick synopsis of the Faust legend. Johann Faustus was born in Rota in the, in the province of Weimar of God-fearing parents. Although he often lacked common sense and understanding, at an early age he proved himself a scholar, mastering not only the holy scriptures, but also the sciences of medicine, mathematics, astrology, sorcery, prophecy, and necromancy. These pursuits aroused him a in him a desire to commune with the devil, so, having made the necessary evil preparations, he repaired one night to a crossroads in the Spencer Forest near Wittenberg. Between 9 and 10 o'clock, he described certain circles with his staff and thus conjured up the devil. Feigning anger at having been summoned against his will, the devil arrived in the midst of a great storm. And after the winds and lightning had subsided, the devil asked Dr. Faustus to reveal his will, to which the scholar replied that he was willing to enter into a pact. The devil, for his part, would agree to the following things. To serve Dr. Faustus for as long as he should live, to provide Dr. Faustus with whatever information he might request, and never to utter an untruth to Dr. Faustus. Well, the devil did agree to these particulars or these conditions on the, with the exception or on the condition that Dr. Faustus would promise the following three things. Ex at the expiration of 24 years to surrender his body and soul to the devil, to confirm the pact with the signature written in his own blood, and lastly, to renounce his Christian faith. So upon reaching the agreement, the pact is drawn up and Dr. Faustus formalized it with his own blood. After that, Dr. Faustus's life was filled with comfort and luxury, but marked by excess and perversion. 
Everything was in, was within his grasp. Elegant clothing, fine wine, sumptuous food, beautiful women, even Hel of Tro Helen of Troy and the concubines from the Turkish Sultan's harem. He became the most famous astrologer in the land for his horoscopes never failed. No longer limited by earthly constraints, he traveled from the depths of hell to the most distant stars. He amazed his students and fellow scholars with his knowledge of heaven and earth. However, for all his fame and fortune, Dr. Faustus could not revoke the 24-year limit to the devil's indenture. Finally recognizing the folly of his ways, he grew even more melancholy. He bequeathed his worldly goods to his young apprentice, a student named Christopher Christoph Wagner from the University of Wittenberg. And shortly after midnight on the last day of the 24th year, the students who had assembled at the home of the ailing Dr. Faustus heard a great commotion. First came the sound of a ferocious storm and then the shouts, first terrifyingly loud then ever weaker from their mentor. At daybreak, they ventured into his room. Bloodstains were everywhere. Bits of brain clung to the walls. Here they discovered an eye and there were a few teeth. Outside, they found the corpse, its members still twitching, lying in a manure pile. His horrible death thus taught them the lesson that had escaped their master during his lifetime, to hold fast to the ways of God and to reject the devil and all his temptations. Now, here are some important themes. The idea of sin, acting contrary to the will of God. In making a pact with Lucifer, Faustus not only renounces God, but he also chooses to swear alliance to the devil. Faustus has repeated opportunities to repent by use of the angel, or angels on his shoulder, the good and bad, the old man, the scholars, until the very last scene where Marlow seems to leave the Christian framework. To heighten their dramatic effect, there is now no forgiveness when Faustus begs for it. Or how about the theme of conflicting worldviews? Conflict between the value systems of the Middle Ages and then moving into the Renaissance. The medieval world placed God at the center of existence. Man and science were pushed to the side. In the age of the secular humanism, though, man was at the center of existence. So Faustus's obsession with individual experience and knowledge made him kind of a poster child for that age. And then how about power corrupts? In the beginning, Faustus has heroic plans. He wants to transcend ordinary limitations, expound the boundaries of science, and unveil the secrets of the world while making maybe a little money and became, becoming famous too. However though, when Faustus gains his limitless power, he kind of contents himself with doing cheap tricks um, and playing, being deceitful, doing deceitful things with the Pope, um, for the nobility, and even cheaper pranks for the commoners. And his great individualism degrades into this selfishness and debauchery. And then lastly, the image of man divided. Throughout the play, Faustus constantly wonders whether he should repent or not. He's constantly struggling with this. He's caught between two desires. Does he do good and serve God? Or, on the other hand, that little devil, does he grasp the power and the pleasure that Mephistopheles offers? So he's good and bad. He's just never sure what to do. Symbols of the struggle that are within Faustus are the good and the bad angel. And it's a very process. Protestant idea that modern Luther Martin Luther's theology that man is by nature weak and divided and that one can be saved only by personal trust in God's grace.